Let's start with some prayer, hey? God, we just thank you so much for your blood. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your conviction, for your power. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for everything it is that you've done and everything that you're continuing to do. Lord, I pray for a fresh, fresh revelation here this morning, Lord Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will touch our hearts, that you will reveal new things to us, Lord, that we would walk away from today empowered to live life the way that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Cool. So today's message is called A New Way of Living. We have been talking um, for the last few months about the Apostle Paul um, and we started off a few months back talking about the life of Paul and we've kind of merged into the teachings of Paul and we've been quite strategic um, in how we've tried to structure this um, series. We wanted to start with Paul the man to get an understanding of who the Apostle Paul was, what he did in his life and, and how that influenced the teachings he brought because actually his teachings were, were pretty out there. He ruffled lots of feathers. He basically said there's a whole new way of looking at things guys and people went we don't like that let's try and kill him and they eventually did basically. Um, and so it's really important that and we sort of get that basis of who he is. And then we moved into speaking the last few weeks uh, about justification. And uh, Pastor Tim talked about this in terms of us being in Christ. And you'll remember he wore that really beautiful jumpsuit. Um, I was hoping that jumpsuit had got left in Darwin. It hadn't. But, you know, it was good for the analogy. Uh, but how when we are... Born again, we are now in Christ. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see us in our mess. He sees Christ and we stand justified before God. And then last week we talked about Christ in us. And um, Tim wore a different shirt, which he painted. And if you missed it, these are... Because the, we actually didn't get last week's on, the, on YouTube, unfortunately. Um, he's showed these two different images of how we are in Christ, but we also have Christ in us. And both of these things are really important for us to get a handle on in terms of understanding what the new creation is. You, you don't get to pick if you're going to be in Christ or have Christ in you. As a born-again believer, you have both. You are both in Christ and have Christ in you. But the subtle differences there are how that is worked out, basically, in the practice of your life. And it also comes down to your state and your standing. These are two very churchy words. Uh, your legal state as a person in Christ, you are made whole, you are justified. God looks at you, sees nothing but the blood of Jesus. However, Christ in you, you still look like you to the rest of the world, um, which looks less perfect. Perfect. Sorry to admit that, but that's how it is. And Christ in you has to be, is, is, is where the Holy Spirit works out who Christ is so that gradually we become more, looking more like Christ to the world. That's the purpose. I want to start today going back a little bit to Paul and I want us to remember to try and forget, depending on how long you've been in church, that you know anything that happens between Acts chapter 1 and chapter 9. If you haven't really been to church or you don't know it well, you're, you're golden. Just listen, you'll be fine. Uh, if you do know, I want you to ignore it because I want us to think about this with some fresh eyes this morning. The start of Acts is a really great time. When you think of this as a movie, you're watching a movie about the birth of the church and how God is just going to infiltrate the whole world and the message is going everywhere and it's amazing. So we start off at the, at the beginning of Acts and Jesus has ascended to heaven and the disciples are in this room and they're praying and they're fervent and then the Holy Spirit pours out all over the place. There's tongues of fire on their heads. It's going crazy. They all start speaking other languages. This is a good story, right? And then this spills out into the community and in one day 3,000 people get saved. 
that's crazy. I, I don't know how many people live in Coffin Bay. I'm gonna f I feel like it's maybe 3,000. Is that, oh, do you reckon that's a good guess? Or is it 3,000 over summer? I don't know. How many people live in Cummins? 800, okay. So more than Cummins gets the entirety of Cummins plus a few more, plus all their families who came for a wedding, um, all get saved in one day. Wow. Yeah, I know. Wow, thank you. That's a good day. And everything is going gangbusters. And everyone's like, we love Jesus so much. And the Holy Spirit's like touching their lives. And there's miracles. There's people that couldn't walk. They're suddenly walking. And this guy over here is like, I actually don't have any money. And this guy's like, that's okay. I'm just going to sell my house and give you some money. Or you can come live with us. And everyone's like, oh, this is great. Like it's family. There's Ananias and Sapphira in there. We're just ignoring them. Um, but, you know, the rest of it is a really, really, really good time. And then there's this like kind of slight problem in Acts chapter 6 where some of the um, families aren't getting fed and they're like, oh no, this is not good. So like, that's okay, we're going to develop some systems and everybody who's excited about systems went, yes, systems entered the church. Yeah. <laughs> some of you got really excited there. <laughs> And they're like, right, we're going to make these people responsible for doing this and these people responsible for doing that. And so the, you know, the apostles are like, yes, we're just preaching now. So they're like just fully immersing themselves in the scripture and spending time in prayer and seeing people healed. And, and then they get all these other guys and they bring in this guy called Stephen. He is not just a waiter. So they're like, we're going to get some people to look after the people who need food. Basically, he's a waiter. But he enters the story. And when he does, like, you know in the movie that this guy is important. He's probably very attractive. In my mind, he's blonde. I don't know why. Um, but he kind of walks in and, you know, flicks back his hair. And he's waiting on the tables. And he's like, would you like another chicken nugget for your child here? And, um, but he's not just a waiter because he loves Jesus. And so as he's given the chicken nuggets, he's praying and he's seeing people healed. And we all really like Stephen. Stephen is a top guy. We're like, he's going to go far. In, this, in the movie version, you're like, oh, what's he going to do? He's like, he is important. This is the way Luke tells the story, by the way, giving us some information. Well, they then arrest Stephen because uh, he loves Jesus. And the Jews are like, we're... Like, yeah, you're a good guy, you're very attractive. But um, this loving Jesus issue is not okay. So they bring him before the Sanhedrin and he gives up and he gives basically a great preach. Like he's also got preaching skills. So he gets up and he tells this story and it's a good story for a Jewish audience. He brings in like all the major characters. He's got Abraham, he's got Jacob and, and uh, David and Solomon and he's preaching right at him and you can kind of they're all like oh yeah we're all watching going oh this is this is going to be good Stephen's going to see the chief priests and the whole Jewish community saved right now Holy Spirit is just going to fall it's got this is it this is the moment this is what it's leading up to right <laughs> then Stephen says this you stiff-necked people your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors and you always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. That's... Uh, it's pretty intense, right? That's not really the moment that we're waiting for. But then, you're like, we're on board with Stephen because he's the hero at this point in the story. So you're like, oh, he just laid into it. Right, that's it. Okay, what's going to happen? Holy Spirit's going to fall now. And then it seems to suggest that because in verse 55, we see these full of the Holy Spirit and he looks up to heaven. He sees the glory of God and Jesus standing there. So this is what we're seeing. We're like, what is Jesus going to do right now? And he's like, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man, he's standing at the right hand of God. This is about to get really, really good. Cue teeth grinding. This, is, this probably wouldn't make the movie cut because 
I don't know, they're all, they all just like, like, <laughs> it's really, really like, what? And then there's all these guys going, Rrr. like that probably would work. We'd probably do something a little bit more dramatic, but we'll forgive Luke for that. And so then they grab Stephen and all of a sudden they're dragging him out of the city and it says they rush. They're rushing and it's like, what is happening here? This is not what was supposed to happen. And they, they take him out of the city and they're all running and the music is swelling and it's, it's loud and we can just hear the sounds of people's feet on the ground and we can hear them yelling and then they just start hurling stones at the guy. You're like, this... This is not supposed to... Stephen is the hero. He, he gives the poor, dis, you know, enfranchised children the chicken nuggets. He's very attractive. He gives great speeches. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And there, here they are stoning them. And in the middle of all of this, you kind of get this split second thing. We're not really paying attention because all we care about is Stephen where some guys take off their coats and they just throw them at the feet of this other guy. You see him for a split second, but who even cares who that guy is? And... Uh, And we just focused on Stephen, who's there, dying. And in this moment, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And the music slows down. Everything moves into slow motion. All we can hear is the thud of rocks as they hit him. We're just seeing the blood. It's all focused on Stephen. The camera moves in. And then this beautiful, God-honouring, amazing person in the midst of this story that's all about hope and it's good, just dies. For a second, we just, we just stay there. And then the camera just pans out back to the guy with the coats. He's just smiling. And then the camera goes black. If you're watching this movie... You're going to be like, I do not like that guy with the coats. You know, we, we understand how movies work, right? When we're shown a picture like that in a movie, we're like, oh, that guy is the bad guy. He is, he is coming back later. We've we got to watch out for that guy. And we should watch out for that guy because Stephen's death, Luke will then tell us, it unleashes something in Saul, um, who, is, who we're told is the person with the coats. And he just goes racing around Jerusalem and he's dragging men and women out of their homes and there's children crying and he's putting them in jail because he doesn't want anyone to believe in Jesus. And he is so zealous. And we're like, this guy is terrible. No one likes this guy. When is this guy going to and get you know struck from lightning from heaven or something we're designed to not like him that's the way Luke tells the story he is the bad guy it tells us he's ravaging the church that's some strong words dragging men and women we don't hear about him much for the rest of chapter 8. We kind of have this interlude where Luke tells us that because of this great persecution, the church started to spread. Before then, they'd all just hung out in Jerusalem having their merry old time because everyone was sharing everything and it's really nice and we're seeing all the miracles and it's lovely and then they're like, oh, this is a dangerous place now, so we've got to get out, out of here. And it tells us that uh, Peter, uh, Philip, rather, he goes into Samaria and he starts preaching the gospel in Samaria and the gospel comes to the Samaritans. So off Peter and John go, they go and do a ministry there in Samaria. And then um, it tells us that um, Philip then goes down to, um, he's heading over to Egypt and he meets the Ethiopian eunuch and he sees that guy get saved and then the Holy Spirit just lifts him up and puts him back in the middle of somewhere and off he goes to Caesarea to spread the gospel. So we hear all these sorts of things and this is all very nice. Maybe Saul sort of forgotten in the movie you're kind of wondering what the heck is happening Um, but then we get to chapter 9 and what happens is Saul goes to the chief priests and he says "Uh, now I'd really like a letter which lets me go to Damascus and um, drag all the Christians out of there and bring them back to Jerusalem and put them in jail and the chief priest goes oh okay let's do that yeah 
So, and the reason he could do that was because hundreds of years earlier, when uh, Israel had finally become a state again, they had this rule with Rome where they were allowed to bring naughty Jews back from neighbouring states and bring them to Jerusalem so they could persecute them. So that's kind of what's happening here. So Damascus is in Syria. It's not Jewish territory. But Paul has, Saul at this point, has authority to go there and bring people back. Now, here is a map. I don't know how much you can see of this. At the t- okay. Oh, look, here we go. There is Jerusalem here, right? At the bottom of the map. Damascus is all the way at the top. It's about 270 kilometres. It's not really a day's walk. Um, Google at one point told me it would take you 56 days to work there, but I think Google was wrong. Um, but I want you to see something else. If Paul is walking from Jerusalem to Damascus, he's probably going to come here through Caesarea, through Samaria. He's going to walk around here through Caesarea. Who's there? Philip. We've just been told Philip's a really great guy. He's also seeing people saved. He's like the next Stephen in the story almost. He's like top guy. All through here, by the way, we've got Christians. Church is just going gangbusters. What's happening in Jerusalem is spread. And he's going to go up here and bring him back and come back down. The stage is set for us to be really, really concerned about what it is that he's going to do. Luke is making sure that we know Saul is the bad guy. He says that Saul is breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the law. That's probably not something that you should breathe, by the way. But you know, he is angry. This is why he goes to the high priest. The stage is set for this story, for either Saul to totally persecute the church all the way through, or for Saul to you know, get eaten by a lion or something. That's probably what we're in anticipating as we're watching this movie, right? If we don't know the story. We get to verse 3. As he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around. Oh, this is good. This is good. God's like, Jesus is just, he's going to take him out now. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice. He says to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? You know, whenever God uses the name twice, it's a moment of high emotion. When um, Abraham was about to offer um, Isaac on, on the mountain and God wanted to catch his attention, he said, Abraham, Abraham. When he saw... Um, Mo- when God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, he was, Moses, Moses. Jesus, when he's talking to Mary and Martha, says, Martha, Martha, what are you so worried about? When God calls your name twice, it's because he has emotion. He is invested in this moment. It's not just like, Oi, Saul, what are you doing? He's not. He's like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul doesn't know who it is. He knows how God speaks. He knows it's Lord. He's going to take from this revelation the fact that the church is the body of Christ. And if you hurt the body, you hurt Christ. He'll preach on that later. But in this moment, this is massive. The worst guy, arguably, in the New Testament, apart from Judas, just had Jesus appear to him to, say, to, to capture his heart. And this guy is going to change the New Testament. You know, Saul carried his entire ministry. Paul, we could probably call him now. What he did to the church. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. 1 Timothy, one of the last letters that he will write, he says, here's a trustworthy saying. It deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus, he came in the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. 
But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in and receive eternal life. From the person who is initially introduced as someone that we need to be worried about, we have we will get the teaching that none of your past matters because of the blood of Jesus. And I wanted to emphasize Saul because it says he was the worst. And if God can do that for him, then none of us have the excuse of our past anymore. But Paul will also make it clear that you have everything now that you need to live the life that you are called to live in Christ Jesus. And I'm not just talking capabilities. Whenever we say, oh, you've got all you need, everyone goes, oh, I've got this gift and I've got this skill and I've got these capabilities. I'm talking about everything you need spiritually because of your position in Christ and because of the work of the Holy Spirit within you. Capabilities, skills, all of that, that can be learned. But this is given. When you are born again, God gives you right then everything you need spiritually to be able to live for Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's like the favourite verse of the CRC movement, I reckon. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. This is what Tim talked about the other week when he climbed into his jumpsuit. If you are in Christ, when you are born again, you become in Christ, okay? And at that moment, that exact moment, the old passes away, the new has come. Some versions say everything has become new. What are we talking about with everything What actually happens here? Well, the first point we need to make is that Christ takes our sin on him and gives us his righteousness. You were never righteous in your own life. You could be the best person in the world, but you were never righteous. And Christ never sinned, but he took your sin and made you righteous and now you have no sin. That is the first thing that happens, this transaction where we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But we are made new on the inside. Ezekiel, prophesying centuries before, said, speaking of God, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. Not some of them, all of your uncleanness and from your idols I will cleanse you. (laughs) How good is that? Anyone here struggling, feeling like you're worshipping something else? He says here, all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and And give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is what Ezekiel says is going to happen. He didn't know what he was talking about. Peter tells us that. He says, the prophets prophesied all these things. They had no idea. They could only hope to understand. Angels look into these things. They didn't understand. And then in Jesus, he comes and in one moment... He transforms everything so that when we are born again, not only do we stand perfected in Christ, but he does something new on the inside. When we're born again, we're not just forgiven for the past, we are made new for the future and the present. It has already all been done. Colossians, Paul talks about this in the language of circumcision. Paul talks about circumcision a lot. Um, In a few weeks, we're going to talk about how much Paul talks about circumcision. So come back for that one. That's going to be great. Um, Often he talks about it literally. Today he's talking about it figuratively. In Colossians 3, he says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to what? Fullness. He is the head over 
every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. What does that mean? He says your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Everyone knows what circumcision is, right? I don't want to paint a picture of it, but you know that there's something there that gets taken off. Yeah. That's what he's saying here. The flesh was taken off you. Your whole self, which is ruled by the flesh, has been removed. For you, having been baptised, buried with him in baptism, in which also were raised with him through your faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So when you come into Christ, not only were you justified, but he got rid of the part of you that's controlled by flesh, which means that you are no longer bound by sin. Did you get that? You are no longer bound by sin. The part of you that was controlled by sin has been taken away. It has been dealt with. Which is great because none of us sin, right? We're all perfect. This doesn't mean we can't sin. But it means we're no longer comfortable when we do it. Because sin is not who we are. You know, and when we do sin, we feel that discomfort because that's not who we are. The, um, I was thinking about an analogy for this and, you know, Tim, everybody knows, is a fisherman. He just loves fishing and he goes fishing and he catches fish, which apparently lots of fishermen don't do. Um, not mentioning any names. Um, <laughs> You should have looked around then to see who shook their finger at me. I don't have to say anything. Um, he goes fishing and he catches fishing and it's, it's fun because he's a fisherman. I, I'm not a fisherman. Like I, I tried for a few years to pretend because, you know, that's what you do when you're first married. Like, yeah, we're into the same things. I don't like fishing. It's smelly, you know, and it's, it's slimy and you get hot and it's boring, and if you don't catch anything, oh, but then if you catch a big thing, it hurts your arms, and I just don't see the point of all of that. Like, like there's so many other ways I could spend my time. Um, the point is, I can go fishing. I can learn to go fishing. I can do all that. But I'm never going to be comfortable with it because I am not a fisherman. That is not in my dear day. It's the same with sin. You are no, if you are born again, you no longer have a sin nature. It is not your nature to sin. So if you sin, you'll feel uncomfortable with it. Mugabe, oh, I can't even read his name right there. It's a um, Ratchikuni, um makes this quote. He says, in God's eyes... You will never be holier than you are now because your holiness was settled in Christ on the cross. Even after you're sinned, it's important to know that in his eyes you're still holy in Christ Jesus and because you are holy, you will not stay in your sin. So this is important. As a son, daughter of God, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't stop sinning so that you can be holy. You stop sinning because you are already holy in Christ Jesus. And I want to pull this apart. Let's go. In God's eyes, you will never be holier than you are right now. That deserved another amen. So I'm going to say it again. In God's eyes, if you are born again, you will never be holier than you are right now. You will never be less holy than you are right now because of the blood of Jesus plus nothing. In your legal state before Christ, you stand in Christ. You are made holy by the blood of Jesus. Nothing you do will add to your holiness. God sees you as holy. That's it. That is settled. But after you have sinned, it's important to know that in his eyes you're still holy because you will sin. You've probably sinned in this message. You know, let's be real. It's just a little thought, just a little distraction, whatever it is. 
even after that, you're still holy in Christ Jesus. And because you're holy, you will choose not to stay in your sin. I am holy. Holiness is my nature. I am a new being. I have the Spirit of God living in me. I am, I am, I am pure and perfect before Christ. When I sin, I'm uncomfortable with that. So I go, I'm not staying there anymore. I'm going to repent. I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus and I'm going to move on with my life because sin is not who I am. As a son, a daughter of God, purchased by the blood of Jesus... You don't stop sinning so you can become holy. You stop sinning because you're already holy in Christ. This is who you are. All that to say, we do sin and we can choose to be comfortable in our sin. And I want to say, if you are comfortable with your sin, you need to repent. Because you're comfortable with something that's totally opposite to who you are. And it will hurt you. You know, you see people, uh, God says, I want you to do this. And they go, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's sin. We often want to go, sin is all the, you know... The things that, uh, you know, drunkenness, orgies, all of that kind of stuff. Um, sin is disobedience. If God told you to do something and you haven't done it and you're off over here doing this thing, it's going to hurt. And you see it. People go, I'm over here doing this thing. I'm being disobedient and I'm not happy and my life sucks. So maybe I'll just do more of this thing or I'll go over here and I'll look. And it's because you tried to get comfortable with sin and sin's not who you are. Instead, your spirit's going, let's get back in line and let's come back over here. All it takes is, I repent, I'm sorry. And then you just step back in and it's all done and dusted. We don't have to live our lives going, what's the point or what am I doing or anything like that because we've got the spirit within us leading and guiding us. We don't have to live in pain, in that spiritual pain or uncomfortable or wondering what's going on because we've chosen to get comfortable with sin. Don't choose that. That's stupid. That's not who you are. But we sin and we need to be sanctified. And Pastor Tim, he's going to talk about this next week and then Pastor Paul's going to finish. Today I just want to say there's two aspects of sanctification. There's an immediate sanctification, which is what happens when you're justified, where all your sins of your past are gone, done, dealt with. And then there's a continual sanctification where the Holy Spirit, Christ in me, works out who I am so that I start to display who Christ is to the world and they see Jesus more and more and more and more. One of my favourite scriptures in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, when this priest, and this priest is talking about Jesus, um, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy Jesus' sacrifice made us perfect and it made us holy because we're in Christ, but there is still a holiness to be outworked. And that is what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. So don't be freaking out thinking that my life looks like a mess. Am I actually saved? Yeah, you'd probably just need some sanctification. You've got some stuff to do. We all do. That's why Tim painted his shirt last week. The things we take away from this are that you are perfect. Your legal state is perfect. The enemy cannot have a go at you because you stand in Christ. When the enemy tries and says, but, 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 you go, shut up, I'm in Christ. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. And you are victorious over sin because you have a whole new nature that doesn't like sin anymore. That's not who you are. Sin is not who you are. And you are still being perfected by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit who gives us everything we need for life and godliness. You know, we started talking about Paul, and I mentioned this when I spoke on him back in March, 
how Paul, after he got saved, he went off into the desert for a bit and he probably went up Mount Sinai because that's where all the men of God went. And he was very much like Elijah in his zealousness. And, and there's, there's these parallels between Elijah and Paul where Elijah, back in 1 Kings 18, he is fighting the prophets of Baal because they're like running all over the place. And um, he brings them all up on the mountain and, and he calls down fire from heaven and destroys them all. And it's a great story. Uh, and then he prays and the drought lifts and it's good. And then he runs up a mountain. And if you know the story, he's there to meet with God. And this earthquake comes and, and the scripture says, oh, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And, and the fire comes, but God wasn't in the fire. And the wind comes, but God wasn't in the, the wind. And then there's this still small voice. And Elijah comes out and God speaks to him. The interesting thing about that is that Baal was considered the prophet of the weather and that's why God sent a drought to say, huh, I've actually got all the power, Baal sucks. Um, but also, you know, when Elijah calls down fire from heaven, he's working in Baal's domain, so to speak. When he calls an end to the flood, he's working in Baal's domain and showing that God's got the power. So Elijah's understanding of God, is all his whole ministry is to, is to show how God is better than Baal. <laughs> It would have been normal for him to expect God in the earthquake or the fire or the wind because that's how he understands that God works. But God doesn't. God comes in the stillness. And Elijah had to encounter God in a new way. And I think that's what happens here is that Paul goes up the mountain because he is a Jew of Jews. He understands sacrifice. He understands how to make yourself righteous. He understands all of the rules and God has called to him, Jesus has called to him and changed him. And now he's got to understand what does that mean for me? What does that mean for the world? It meant that Paul needed a new way of thinking and a new way of living. And that's why we have the silent years where Paul goes and he dwells and he prays. And God unveils to him this mystery that Jesus' blood doesn't just do away with the sacrificial system. It does away with everything. Yeah. You know, we are now new people in Christ. Can I get the band up, please? I grew up in church and I, um, I've always loved the Word of God. I've always felt like I had a good understanding of the Word of God. But we... <laughs> If our church ever preached this kind of message, I didn't hear it. Um, I didn't understand it. And it wasn't until I was much, much older that I first heard that um, the blood of Jesus actually made me perfect. And my first thought was, well, that's just heresy. Because um, I'm not perfect. Like, I couldn't get my head around that. Uh, but then there was enough... In scripture that made me go, what if that's right? What if that's actually true? What if, what if I am made perfect? And, you know, I had lived a really good Christian life up until my late teens when I, um, I got angry. I got angry at church. I got angry at people at church. I got angry at family. I made stupid, stupid decisions. And for years, I lived with the guilt of that and I knew that God had saved me and I knew that God had called me and I knew that God had forgiven me I didn't think he could trust me I thought there was a line for Jess and so to hear that it's all dealt with but there's what is new is in you it's just like what how do you even how do you even you know and the the big moment for me came, I was at a CRC Bible camp and somebody came and they gave me this prophetic word and they said, oh Jess, I, it's like you're riding on a bike and you crashed the bike. And I'm like, yeah. Um, and, and God wants you to know, and in my head I'm preempting what they're going to say. They're going to say, God says, get back on the bike. And I'm like, that's a good word. You know, it's encouraging. It 
means purposeful. It means you can still keep writing. They didn't say that. They said, God says, here's a new bike. And it wrecked me. Because a bike is expensive. You should look after a bike. If you crash your bike, you should just, you know, you should just ride your broken bike because that's your own stupid fault. And if it's got some dents in it and some dings in it, that's your fault. But you get up and you ride it and he's like, here's a whole new bike that I didn't deserve. But he just gave me that. He makes us new for purpose. He saves us from the past. (laughs) And he gives us a future. And everything we need for it is in us. And I want us to take a moment this morning because I think there's some people who, who might be struggling with the fact that you're clean from anything. There might be some people that are struggling with the fact that you've got any hope for the future. There might be some of you that are just like, you know what? I've been running. I've got so comfortable with sin that my life is actually so ridiculously uncomfortable right now. Or maybe it's only recent that you've said no to Jesus and you're like, I just want to get back. I want to get back before I get comfortable. I want to get back now. I want to, I want to repent. I want to, I want to live out this new creation life. I want to remember that I have everything for life and godliness and I want to pursue the purpose that God has for me. You know, Saul was travelling to, to stop the spread of the gospel. God didn't actually change his life vocation that much. He just said, keep travelling, but now go spread the news everywhere. You know, he gave him purpose and that's what we he wants to give to us today too because he's already given us what we need for it. So we're going to have a time of worship. If you want to come out the front, you can. But you, if you want to pray with the person next to you, pray with the person next to you. If you, you do your business with God. If you need to go climb a mountain this week, go climb a mountain. Whatever it is. Lord, we thank you that you don't leave us in our sin. We thank you that you're full of second and third and fourth and fifth and that your, your mercies are new every morning, Lord. We thank you that we are no longer bound to sin. We thank you for the victory that we stand in in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that blood that saved us. We thank you, Christ, that you envelop us in you so that God looks at us and just sees you so that the enemy has no, uh, no authority over us anymore. We thank you that you stay with us, that you work with in us, that you're transforming us, that you don't just go on your merry way, work it out yourself. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power. We thank you for what it is that you're doing in the hearts and the lives of your people and of your church. We pray, Lord, reveal to our hearts now those places where we need to grasp this, those moments where we're struggling with this and we just need that fresh revelation. Holy Spirit, you bring your revelation in Jesus' name.